All right, well, it is 7.01, so we're going to get rocking tonight. So I want to welcome you guys to our Tuesday theology class. Uh, tonight we're going to be uh, continuing on in our study. Before we do that, let's uh, open with a word of prayer, and then we'll jump into uh, to chapter 24 and the content uh, therein. So let's pray. Lord, Lord, we thank you so much for today and for the time that we have to spend together. I pray that as we talk about this uh, this subject, that you would uh, be gracious to us and help us to understand, uh, and not just to understand it, but we 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 pray that this would uh, we would see opportunities to apply this in our lives, uh, not just in our lives, but in those around us. So we pray that you would give us uh, grace and understanding, and then also in applying, uh, so that we can become more like Christ. And it's in His name we pray. Amen. Now there are doctrines that we study that may seem kind of ethereal, kind of vague, and out there. Um, and then there are doctrines that evoke uh, real emotion because we can connect those doctrines with real people. And there are probably people, as you read through this chapter, that you started wondering, you know, what does this mean for them? What does this mean for them in their lives uh, as it relates to their salvation? And the doctrine today may seem pretty straightforward. So when we read it, it seems it's something that a lot of us have been taught. Uh, but there are real life situations that that we may point to that can do a couple of things for us. Some, some may leave us fearful uh, for people or maybe even for ourselves. Uh, whenever we think about this, it may leave us hopeful um, at God's work in us and how he continues to preserve us across uh, the course of our lives. And also it can even uh, evoke kind of a, um, a thought or consideration of joyful, uh, that this is what God is doing. He's moving us towards an eternity with him. Now, um, this, this, uh, this, this chapter is called the, the Perseverance of the Saints, um, and it's, uh, it's dealing with the idea of being able to remain a Christian, um, and then how can we know uh, if we are truly born again? Some of the questions that we are trying to, to ask and answer, how do we know that we're going to continue on, uh, continue to be Christians throughout our lives? So how do we know that it's not just something that happens and then doesn't happen, or it's an on again and off again kind of a situation? Uh, is there anything that will keep us from falling away from Christ? Uh, anything that will guarantee that we will remain Christians until we die, and that we will in fact live with God in heaven forever? Or might it be that we will turn away from Christ and lose the blessings of our salvation? Another way that you may have heard uh, this term or this doctrine taught, uh, if you're in Southern Baptist life, um, for sure you've heard uh, this, these words uh, talking about eternal security or the eternal security of the believer. How many for you of this, this, uh, this topic is the first time that you've ever heard about eternal security? Nobody? Okay. How many of you have ever heard, never heard the term perseverance of the saints? How many of that, how many for you, this is a new term for you in that? Okay. So we have heard about eternal security, um, and some of us, uh, that's a new term for us, is perseverance of the saints, um, which is, there's, a, there's some reasoning behind that. But what I want us to do, <clears throat> you may have been able to do this across the time. He didn't really go into this a lot. He did with a few different denominations, but um, this doctrine is something that uh, different theological positions and denominations um, argue about, right? There's, there's a disagreement across the spectrum of Christianity as to uh, whether or not people are actually eternally secure, uh, whether there is any kind of security or assurance that we can have uh, that we will be saved. The, doctor, uh, the position that Wayne Grudem takes is uh, the kind of the Reformed position, uh, and he talks about it in terms of the perseverance of the saints, means that all those who are truly born again will be kept by God's power and will persevere as Christians until the end of their lives. And that only those who persevere until the end have been truly born again. So that's the kind of the, the historical reformed position uh, that, that Wayne Grudem uh, teaches. There's another position um, that, that you may be familiar with. Um, it, is, it is part of the Free Grace Movement, uh, the Free Grace Alliance. There are other churches that kind of fall into uh, this camp. Um, now this one... Uh, deals, it says that the kind of this is a, a, a quote from uh, one of their leading teachers. Uh, it says the Christian is eternally secure through God's grace, whether or not he or she dies in a state of grace by persevering in good works. OK, uh, perseverance in faith is the believer's choice and the means by which believers can achieve maximum joy and fulfillment, both in this life as in uh, and uh, as well as in eternity. 
Now, they also say, even if a believer for all practical purposes becomes an unbeliever, his salvation is not in jeopardy. Believers who lose or abandon their faith will retain their salvation. So there's a teaching out there that says, as long as you prayed that prayer and meant it, that you're safe, right? No matter what happens the next day or the next week or 10 years down the road, if you prayed that prayer and believed it, then you are safe, then you are saved. Even if your life for all practical purposes looks like an unbeliever or if you deny the faith, right? So even if you come to the point where you say, I don't even believe in Jesus anymore. Well, because you believed at one point in time, that overrides your unbelief at the end of the time, okay? So that's kind of how that, that free grace uh, movement um, goes. And there's a controversy that goes back and forth with that. We can talk about that more. Um, don't have to, but there's that position out there, okay? Um, and so you, you may be familiar with people who, uh, who will say things like, you know, I know that my life doesn't look like a Christian. Um, I don't really go to church any, don't study the Bible, don't have any desire. Uh, I'm involved in multiple sins, but I prayed uh, and believed in Jesus whenever I was five or six years old. And so it's kind of like a fire insurance, right? That, that gets me in and I'm good to go uh, for the rest of, uh, of my life. Then you have uh, the Catholic view related to um, eternal security. So what they teach is that there are, there are categories of sin um, and uh, by committing, so you have mortal sins and venial sins. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Catholic teaching. Uh, venial sins are kind of the unknown, uh, unintended sins uh, that you commit. Mortal sins are what the scripture talks about in terms of high-handed sins or that you know what you're doing and you still do it anyways. Um, and so they say that mortal sins, um, by committing mortal sins, you can lose your salvation because mortal sins destroy, destroy, do away with, end, destroy, the grace of God in the heart of the sinner. So mortal sins can destroy the justifying grace that God uh, does in our lives, our justification. Uh, by their very grave nature, a mortal sin cuts our relationship off from God and turns man away from his creator. So you're, this is when you think of the practice of penance and confession and all the, of the, the practices of Catholicism are meant to override even mortal sins, right? So you can be cut off uh, through mortal sins. Now, uh, we also have uh, more, uh, more um, denominations. Now, there are several in this, and there's going to be different veins of what it looks like in each tradition, each, uh, each area of this. Uh, Arminianism, Wesleyan Methodism, Pentecostalism, um, these are all kind of similar in their, in their perspective on eternal security. Uh, one article uh, for, oh, that was on the UMC website uh, said, do Methodists believe once saved, always saved? Can we lose our salvation? That's the question that they wanted to answer. Uh, a very short but incomplete answer is that our church teaches we can end up losing the salvation God has begun in us. And the consequence of this in the age to come is our eternal destruction in hell. God freely grants us new birth and initiates us into the body of Christ uh, in baptism. The profession of our faith and growth and holiness are necessary for God's saving grace to continue. So remember, uh, it's necessary for His saving grace to continue. It's work in us. And both of these things we must engage in for our love to be genuine and not compelled. We thus remain free to resist God's grace, to revert to spiritual torpor. I don't know, have you ever used that word in a sentence? <laughs> Me either. It's a new one. So now you know it. I guess, I mean, it, mean, I guess it means darkness. Um, yeah, well, somebody wants to Google that one and give us an answer. That's great. Uh, and possibly experience spiritual death and hell as its consequence. Now, remember, what is a, uh, we've, we've talked about this a little bit. What is one of the primary underlying factors within Arminianism, uh, uh, Wesleyanism, Methodism? What, do you remember one of the kind of operating principles there that we are? So that would be more the Reformed view, right? So what is the kind of the operating principle within um, Arminianism? Remember that? That our will kind of overrides, right? So we, we, are, the, we are completely free uh, in doing what we want to, even in, as it relates to our ability to be saved and not saved. So they're saying that we can become a Christian and then decide one day that you want to not be a Christian and that you can override even God's will uh, and his power in keeping you uh, a believer. So um, this is not, uh, you see the words like, it must be genuine and not compelled. That's the same kind of language, right? That, that it must, we, must re we must remain free to resist God's grace. 
We must remain uh, able to go back to the spiritual darkness that we are a part of. We must be able to do that uh, for us to be able to, to actually be free in our uh, love and response to God. Okay, so those are four, um, four kind of broad categories. Does anybody have any questions about those? I'm not a practicer of, of all of them, so uh, I can answer as much insofar as I've done the research. So any questions on that one? Yes, ma'am. Oh, good. I'm so glad. <laughs> it's apathy or dullness. Dullness. Okay, so we can, re- we can return back to our spiritual dullness or, uh, you know, being, being kind of blinded uh, in spiritual, spiritual matters. Okay? Anybody have any questions about those? No? Well, my brother keeps changing churches. Okay. Okay. I don't know if he's saved or not. Okay. Sure. Yeah, so one thing just to remember that the church that we, the denomination that we affiliate with doesn't uh, determine our salvation, right? So um, they're, they're going to have different views about that uh, as it relates to their, their uh, assurance of salvation, um, so, which is in, uh, interesting because Presbyterian would be much more reform, reformed theologically, and then uh, Methodist is... is typically more uh, related to Arminian uh, theology. So it's an interesting kind of difference there. But, um, you know, we're not, we are not all consistent in what we do. So um, it's interesting. So, okay, so those are your four, four kind of broad categories as it relates to that. Again, uh, Wayne Grudem teaches us or, or uh, presents uh, a reformed view of, um, of perseverance, uh, of once saved, always saved, uh, or of eternal Security. That's a that that once saved, always saved. You guys have probably heard that as well. That's that is kind of that is one of the. So it is a. So it's a biblical truth, right? Um, but it's one of the kind of monikers or markers of the free grace uh, theology, um, because you can say once saved, always saved equals it doesn't matter what you did after, for the rest of your life. Once you were saved, you were always saved, right? So you can see sometimes how that uh, that can become. Uh, challenging, especially whenever you're interacting with people who show no evidence or have even maybe walked away from the faith completely. Um, so there's there's uh, things we'll talk about at the end as to how we can come, we can kind of engage with uh, with people in a variety of areas. So um, w- the first the first point of teaching that we have in this uh, is this: uh, all who are truly born again will persevere to the end. So this is a, the statement that that uh, Grudem makes in his book. Um, he supports this with several passages of Scripture. Uh, the first he uses is John 6, 38 through 40. Uh, I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up at the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. The text emphasizes in this uh, that uh, he should, that Jesus uh, will lose nothing uh, of all that has been given to him. Uh, And whenever we think of that in terms of 639, um, everyone who sees the Son, uh, believes in him, shall have eternal life. And that he will lose, Jesus will lose nothing of all that he has given me, but will raise it up at the last day. Interestingly enough, whenever we think about the context in John chapter 6, do you guys remember what happens uh, shortly after Jesus says this uh, to the, the crowd who is listening to him. Do you guys remember what happens in John chapter 6? All right, so that happens at the beginning, right? So the, John, John, the beginning of John 6 is the feeding of the 5,000, uh, and then they go across the side, and he starts teaching them on the bread of life. Do you guys remember what happens near the end of John chapter 6? They leave, they leave right? And Jesus says, I know whom is going to believe and who is not going to believe, and then he has a mass exodus of people who walk away. Uh, and yet, there are people, Peter, Peter says this, and then the disciples stay with him. Um, Jesus says to them, do you want to go away also? Right? Do you guys want to leave too? Everybody else is leaving. And Peter says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have come to know and believe that you are, you are God. Uh, you are the Son of God. Um, and we even think about that in relation to when Peter says that before, Who does Jesus tell Peter told him that? That he was the son of the living God. Do you remember what he said? 
Flesh. That's right. That's right. So flesh and blood hasn't revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven has revealed this to you. So we see this, this uh, picture of everyone who sees him, sees him with spiritual eyes opened and, and knows him, uh, will come to him uh, and will have eternal life. And Jesus will. These are not might. This is not possibly. This is not, uh, you know, off chance that I'm having a good day. Uh, he will raise him up at the last day. We also see in John um, chapter 10, uh, where Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give them eternal life and they shall never perish and no one shall snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the father's hand. Now, do you think when Jesus says no one, he means no one? He means no one, right? Uh, it's not like we can just jump out of the hand, right? So he means nobody can take us out of his hand. Um, and so this is just a good reminder for us. Not only that, uh, it's just an amazing, if you think about that, um, no one shall snatch them out of my hand and my father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the father's hand. So you think about that. You are, you are secure in Jesus and the father himself is also securing us in Christ. Uh, we, are, we, are, uh, we are secure in him. We also see uh, in Romans chapter eight, uh, verse one, uh, there is therefore now, remember this is a great, a great just comforting verse for us. Whenever we think of Romans chapter eight, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, uh, which is just a, a hopeful reminder. There's never, not now, nor will there be condemnation for those who are in Christ. Why? Because Jesus has received all of the condemnation that we deserved and we are free in him. We have, or we have that position uh, in Christ. So then the question becomes, can God, who has now said we are not condemned, put us back in a position of condemning us again? Right? This is the kind of the argument or the question that is trying to be answered whenever we think of this in relation to Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Um, can we go back to a position where this is no longer true of us? Right? Can we go from being condemned to not condemned to back to condemned to not condemned? Can we just jump back and forth as much as we want to? Or is there a surety uh, that there is, therefore, that this promise is, in fact, true? We also see in Romans chapter eight, we've talked about this as it relates to um, kind of the chain of salvation, uh, how these things are written in a past tense in many ways. Those whom he predestined, he also called, and those whom he called, he also justified. Those whom he justified, he also glorified. So there is a reality that once, once God is doing this work, as he's doing this work, that there is surety that he's going to complete it. And we think of even Galatians 1, uh, 6, that he who began a good work in you We'll bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. So there's great confidence that God is uh, working in, uh, in, uh, in us to keep us uh, secure. We also see, um, not only do we see God working in this, his promises, uh, his power shown, uh, but we also see that he gives us something that is evidence of our continuance in the faith. Uh, he gives us his spirit. Uh, in him you also who have heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and have believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, which is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. You guys uh, read this in, uh, in the book, but the Greek word guarantee is, um, is a legal and commercial term that means the first installment or the down payment or the deposit uh, or a pledge um, and represents a payment which obligates the contracting party to make further payments. So in many ways, it's saying that this spirit is the first payment, the first installment of God's promise to fulfill uh, his work of salvation in our lives until we acquire possession of it, this inheritance that he has promised to us. We also uh, see uh, a passage in 1 Peter, which is, um, which is just a phenomenal passage. I want you guys, if you have your Bibles, we're just going to read not just that one passage, that one verse, uh, verse five, but let's read the whole kind of uh, the context of that. Uh, so we're going to read verses three through five, because this is the kind of the, the section there. Uh, five is part of a larger sentence that Peter writes with a lot of commas. Um, my wife tells me that I use too many commas. I said, I'm just trying to write like the Bible writers do. She says, that doesn't work. Um, it says, blessed be the God and Father, verse three of 1 Peter chapter one. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, 
He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. It's kept in heaven for you. For you who? Who, who is this? Who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So we see uh, this word um, guarded and this picture that God is, uh, is showing us that we are protected, that we are kept um, in salvation. God is preserving believers from uh, walking out of his kingdom. He's protecting them from attacks, okay, from the enemy. Um, now, as we consider this first part of, of this, this doctrine or this, this teaching uh, related to the fact that, um, that those who are born again will persevere to the end, who in this section is the um, the the uh, responsibility on for believers making it to the end. God, God right? So as we read this, um, it's necessary to remember that God is the one who is working in uh, persevere in in preserving us. So uh, R.C. Sproul says that uh, this this word perseverance can become it can it can sound a little bit challenging for us. Um, and he suggests that we call it the preservation of the saints. Um, preservation because God doesn't simply save us and then send us off to fend for ourselves, right? So he doesn't just save us and then say, all right, now it's up to you to make sure that you make it all the way to the end. I'm hands off. You got to figure it out now. You just got to, you just got to pull it up by your bootstraps and uh, make it on, on your own. Because he says this, if we were left to our own strength, we would all fail to make it. Uh, we would not persevere. Because, uh, because of our nature. We will persevere because we are preserved by God's grace through his power, working through faith. So we are preserved by God's power. So whenever we think about our salvation being secure, it's not secure because of us, it's, be it's secure because of God's power. Now, some might say, well, that's just free grace, right? That's the free grace theology. As long as you believe, then you're safe. God's gonna do all the work. Well, um, that's not what we see in Scripture. Right? What we see oftentimes in, uh, in different teachings is there's a highlight on one part of Scripture, maybe to the uh, demise of other pieces of Scripture. So we don't use it all in concert to say, what is the whole Bible teaching us about this particular doctrine? What do we learn from different parts of Scripture? So um, we are called to be active in this perseverance. That is why they say perseverance. Um, the second principle is that only those who persevere to the end have been truly born again. Now we're gonna look at the same verse that we looked at in 1 Peter, but I've highlighted different words than we had in the previous verse, okay? So in the first, in the first highlighting, it is uh, those who are by God's power are being guarded through faith. So remember it's God's work, but they are being guarded through faith. Now faith is not something that is just kind of a, a passive thing, right? We are active in trusting God and following Him and submitting to Him. We are guarded through faith. So this is the means by which God is preserving us, His power working through faith uh, for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Do you guys see how that dynamic works? Kind of following me on this? Okay, if we have questions, let's, we'll slow down and, and kind of parse through it a little bit more. Um, so... Scripture emphasizes that those who are truly born again will persevere to the end uh, and will be certainly will have eternal life. Um, guard, God does not guard us apart from faith. Okay, So he doesn't just guard us. He doesn't guard us apart from faith. Faith is the active uh, principle that is working in our lives to continue moving us forward. He works through our faith so that he enables us to continue to believe in him. Uh, in this way, those who continue to trust in Christ gain assurance that God is working in them and guarding them. We see uh, one of the passages that Grudem points us to is John 8. Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. So we see this over and over in scripture. Uh, we see it in Matthew chapter 10, verse 22. He who endures to the end will be 
saved. So Jesus is giving us warnings. He is giving us reminders. Um, he is giving us encouragements that in the midst of persecution or other, other situations, trials in our lives, that we are called to continue uh, persevering or pursuing him uh, in our lives. He, and the Apostle Paul says the same in uh, Colossians chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. He writes that, uh, In order to present you holy and blameless and irreproachable, uh, um, or uh, stainless, uh, uh, spot free before him, provided, provided that you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel, which you heard. So there is a, a promise there, right? That there is salvation, um, that you will be presented holy and blameless and irreproachable before him as long as you continue in the faith, stable, steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel which you heard. So it's only natural that Paul and other New Testament writers uh, would, would share this. They're addressing people who profess to be Christians. So the people that Paul is writing to are people that are professing believers. And so he's reminding them, now it's not just that you have this, this gospel that you have believed in the past. It's something that you're continuing to walk in. Uh, we see in 1 Corinthians 15 where he talks about it's the gospel that saved you, that you're now standing firm in, and that will ultimately be your salvation, that you are walking in, you're standing in this grace. Um, so we, we see that there are additional emphasis of this um, in Scripture. Um, Paul, in, in this passage, is uh, knows that those whose faith is not real will eventually fall away from participation and the fellowship of the church. And so he reminds them uh, that salvation is, a, is, is um, we are kept by God's power um, and uh, we are responsible for walking in faith, provided that you continue in the faith. And those who are genuine believers will show that in their lives by continuing on in the faith, by persevering, by continuing to be faithful with Christ, that God will be first in their hearts. A similar emphasis is seen in, um, in uh, we see it in Hebrews chapter 3. He reminds us of that in the book. Uh, but we also see uh, that um, in other passages as well. The reminders for us, uh, there are in incidences. Uh, so we don't think that, um, uh, we sh he writes in the book, we, we should remember that there are other evidences elsewhere in Scripture that give Christians assurance of salvation. Uh, so we should not think that assurance uh, that we belong to Christ is impossible until we die. There are some that say we can't know until we die, right? We can't know that we're going to be saved until we die. And then God kind of makes a determination based on our works, whether we did enough or whether we didn't do enough. Uh, we can have assurance in this life um, that we uh, are faithfully walking with him. Continuing the faith is one of the means of assurance that, um, that is named by the author of Hebrews. And uh, we also see that in these, the purpose is never to make those who are presently trusting in Christ worry that sometime in the future that they might fall away. So God doesn't write these things so that we start thinking, well, is that going to be me one day? Is that going to happen to me one day? No, he writes these things so that we just continue to remind ourselves to walk by faith. That every day we wake up and we remind ourselves of the gospel and remind ourselves of what God's called us to. And we continue each and every day to take more steps of faith. Now, we know that this is, uh, we see these two uh, primary truths, but then the questions begin to arise. What about the people who look like Christians? You know, maybe there are people that have served in the church. Maybe there are people that uh, have done Bible studies with us. Maybe there are people that served on uh, committees. Maybe there are people that were pastors in churches. And it seems that they have fallen away from, from the church, from the truth. We also see in Scripture, and Grudem brings this up, uh, the top section there, those who finally fall away may give many external signs of conversion. He, he uh, quotes Jesus in Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you evil doers. So we see uh, even in Scripture um, that there, there, are, there are pictures, and we think about this, it's clear 
um, that which people have genuine faith when we think about the church. And then there are some that are only intellectually persuaded of the truth, right? So you know people that, that their life doesn't have any evidence of, of saving faith, but they know information about Jesus. They may say, he's a good person. I believe that he was a good guy. And maybe there are people in our church that even have that. Um, but then we're talking about this, this group of people who have somehow exhibited signs of conversion. Maybe they had a hunger for the word at one point in time. Maybe they were involved in church activities, but now they uh, seem to have fallen away or, or who have finally fallen away. We know that in uh, scripture, there are examples uh, and he gives a few like Judas who betrayed Jesus, right? Judas, if we would have looked at Judas in year two, we would have said, man, this guy is, we need to follow him. Like he is an up, he is, he's part of the twelve. Like, this is a guy that is worth following. And if I was going to have somebody go plant a church, he might be the guy, right? He's, he knows how to handle finances. We know that he really didn't. Um, but he's, he, he's, he's, he's outgoing. He's, he's got all these gifts. They would look from the outside like, man, he's a really a faithful follower. But we know that he ultimately fell away. Um, we also see that Paul talks about false brethren that are secretly brought in. Um, that he is in danger from false brethren. He also says that there are that the servants of Satan disguise themselves as um, as servants of righteousness. Grudem does make some helpful points in there for us. He says not all um, unbelievers in the church who nevertheless give some signs of true conversion are servants of Satan, secretly undermining the work of the church. Uh, so. I don't still call around, go around talking about people as if they're like messengers of Satan. Just, I would just encourage you not to do that in your interactions with people. Uh, might be a little off-putting for people um, because there are some that are, that are there that are not believers but are considering the claims of Christ. And we want to make sure that we give them opportunities to ask those questions and that we can answer them from the Bible. Um, we also see in Scripture uh, this passage, but then there are a few others that are further along in the New Testament uh, that are helpful for us in seeing that there are people who show signs of conversion, but who ultimately fall away. Uh, John writes in 1 John, he writes several things in 1 John that are helpful for us, but he says this, he says, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. That's, a, that's for us that read English, that's like, wow, that's a lot of words to say they left us. Um, but they went out that it might become plain that they were not of us, right? So that there's this group of people that were part of the, the group, but then they left and now their teaching and their lives show evidence that they really were never part of the church. They were never really part of the faith, but they had shown some evidence along the way that they were, uh, that they were believers, or at least that they could have been considered that. There's another one that, that whenever I think of uh, getting my name in the Bible, this is not the guy that I would want to be, um, his name was Demas. I don't know if you guys know anything about Demas, but he's, he's written in, in Scripture uh, positively uh, in some passages. But then when Paul, near the end of his ministry, uh, writes to Timothy, he says um, he, he encourages him to come to him soon. And he says these are some of the reasons for Demas in love with this present world has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. So Demas has done lots of stuff with Paul. They've been ministry partners together. But now there is there is this love of the world that Demas has had um, that has caused him to leave Paul where he was and and uh, uh, presumptively uh, left the church, left the faith uh, in this situation. Now, uh, we have some passages in Scripture, primarily whenever you get into Hebrews, where there's a lot of discussion about what about these passages, you know, because you have some really strong warning passages in, uh, in the book of Hebrews. So sometimes the question becomes, well, what about the warning passages? Well, there are warning passages in, in the Bible. What's the purpose of them being there? Because whenever you read them, um, it can sound like that person could really lose their salvation, right? That it could be a person that was a believer that could actually lose their salvation. We see one of them is in Hebrews chapter 6. Uh, for it is impossible to restore again to repentance those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the goodness of the word of God 
and the powers of the age to come, if they then commit apostasy, since they crucify the Son of God on their own account and hold him up to contempt. So we see that there are warning passages uh, in Scripture. Now, uh, we'll go back and just kind of reference. There's a, a, a New Testament scholar. His name's Tom Schreiner. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with him. He's at uh, Southern Seminary. He's, a, uh, he's written many papers and, and uh, commentaries, but he does. Uh, he has an article um, on, and a, actually a lecture series, on uh, the function of the warnings in Hebrews. So why did God put them there? Uh, and from his, I'll just kind of give you a couple of the solutions that people come up with as it relates to these passages. And they'll actually fit um, in with what we've, the ones that we've talked about before. So theological systems um, try to keep consistent views, right? So they try to keep a a consistent way to answer questions. Um, So we talked about the Arminian view, um, which would be Wesleyan, uh, those. So in their view, uh, the warning passages in Hebrews he calls the loss of salvation view. Okay, so we've talked about that briefly, uh, which um, in their perspective, the writing is to Christians, right? These are warnings to Christians who are truly Christians. They warn against apostasy or turning away from the faith. um, And the consequence is a loss of salvation. So they believe that there is writing to true Christians. They warn against apostasy uh, or leaving the faith. And the consequence is a loss of salvation. He says the free grace view, we talked about that, right? The once saved, always saved in the sense of it doesn't really matter what your life looks like after salvation. Um, He says the warnings are addressed to Christians. They warn against a lack of fruitfulness. Okay, so it's not a lack of uh, warning against apostasy. It's a warning against uh, a lack of fruitfulness. And the consequence is a loss of rewards. You may have heard that, that, uh, that their rewards in heaven are just diminished because they didn't faithfully follow all the way to the end, that their lives were not as fruitful as they should have been. Okay, so that's the free grace view. Then you have the one that is uh, the test of genuineness view. Okay, so that these are uh, written to um, a mixed audience of believers and unbelievers. So these warnings to the, to the Hebrews, there's unbelievers and believers both in the crowd. They warn against apostasy, and the consequence is a recognition that one was never saved. Right? So if we read the book of Hebrews and think about it in terms of a church, um, there are people in our church that are believers, and then there are church in our, people in our church that are not believers. Some that think that they're believers, but maybe aren't. And the warnings are against apostasy, right? against walking away or falling away. And the consequence is, it's just a test of your genuineness. If you walk away, you were never saved. Uh, if you don't walk away, then you were genuinely converted. And that these warnings function to, to bring that to light. Mr. Emery, do you have a question? Uh, I, saw you that, sit, I saw you perk is up. Is that kind of the view that... Grudem takes. You Grudem takes. Yes. My question on that then is uh, about the Holy Cloud and Veil. And have become partakers of the Holy Spirit. These people apparently have been saved and have the Holy Spirit and have tasted the goodness of the Word of God mm-hmm. and warning them against committing apostasy. Mm-hmm. So, so in that view, there's the picture of that. We don't know who's a believer and who's not a believer. So in, in, his, in his view, there, he's, he's talking to a group in Hebrews. He's talking to a group of people that he doesn't know who was a believer and who's not a believer, right? And he's warning them to say, if you've, if you've had an experience of some sort with the Holy Spirit, right? That if you've, if you've uh, understood something of the truth of God's word, uh, if you've um, seen the goodness of God at work in the life of the church in some capacity, but you still go away, then you never were a believer. So that's the, that's the test of genuineness view. Um, and that would be the view that Grudem is, is teaching. Um, um, and uh, so that's, that's, those are some of the views that are out there that can help us whenever you interact with people. Yes, ma'am. Why is it impossible to restore them? So again, he's reminding them that uh, 
so if it's in, in the context of this, that they, there's no longer a way for them to be saved. If they've rejected Jesus as their savior, then there's not, there's not a sufficient way for them to be saved. So they can't be, they, there's not another way. There's not a second way. Um, he's the only way. And so if they've kind of rejected that, then there no longer remains a way for them to be saved is the picture, James. I, I was just going to suggest the difficult passages when you're just looking at three verses to look at the ones around it. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I think for this one, that's really important because if you just go back um, to verse one in chapter six, therefore let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ, mm -hmm. go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance. So the idea of repentance again is already showing up in mm -hmm. verse one. And afterwards, once you get to verse seven, it starts talking about land is drunk, the rain that often falls on it produces a crop useful to those for whose sake it is cultivated to receive the blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and thistles, it is worthless and near to being cursed and its end is to be burned. So uh, in my mind, I see the, the person who is under the teaching, mm -hmm. but bears thorns and thistles. And so the only way to be listening to something and still bearing thorns and thistles is to never have been in faith. Right, which is the test of genuineness kind of view to say, look at your life, what does it look like? And if it is, it is bearing bad fruit, right, no, no fruit, then the question comes back to say, well, is that person, have they ever actually experienced saving faith, right? And I, I also think, too, that, uh, that you've got to look at who this was wrote to. Mm -hmm. Because this was Jews that were considering, you know, had come in mm -hmm. and heard this gospel, and they were considering going back right. to the law, back into bondage again as well. Yeah. And so, and that's the reason he said, you know, right. There's nothing else that's going to save you. Right. So if you go back to Judaism, there's no hope in that. Yeah, there's no hope there. Right. Yeah. Yes, sir, Mr. Kern. I was, when I'm reading this, I'm saying that they, they've already believed in Jesus to the point where the Holy Spirit has come into them. Uh, and they have tasted the goodness. Okay, so, you know, like, one th you've accepted uh, Jesus as your Savior, and then the Holy Spirit actually showed you something. You know, there's another movement that's going on, which is what I see is is something that I personally struggle with. Is when can you feel that? Well, they're saying they felt that. Yeah, in some and capacity. If they turn away from that. I mean, what? Left, it wasn't just that they accepted Jesus. They, the Holy Spirit came and moved in them. And they still bricked up the, sure. the walls yeah. and said no. Which is, you know, I think with so many Christians, myself included, it's like, when do I really feel the Holy Spirit moving in my life? Uh, I believe, I believe all this. You know, I can see it in other people. Mm -hmm. I mean, trust me, when I see so many preachers up there preaching, it's like, it's obvious that the Spirit is involved in, in the messages that come out. Not all I've heard something no, I'm not fucking here but in my life. Sure. But it's obvious in so many times to some people, but then others slave people maybe or something. I just not sure that any one moment the spirit has actually moved me, but they're saying it has. It's moved these people. And then they rejected it. Yeah. That there's at least some experience. Uh, again, they he, he mentions um, the words and again so there's, there's reasons why, so I'll just, as a caveat here, there's reasons why there are multiple books that are written about the warning passages in Hebrews, because we have multiple people that have different views on it and how they interpret it uh, goes to different, uh, different theological persuasions, okay? So um, even, even as we have Bible studies on campus, people start asking the question, well, what do these warning passages mean? What, is, what does it mean for, uh, for these people? Um, and again, they have... They have uh, tasted the gift they have shared in the Holy Spirit. Again, what that means, uh, does it mean that they've shared in what God's done or the gifts that they've seen, experienced? So people that maybe, again, I think of people that have, um, have shared in the goodness of what God does as the Spirit is working, um, and then they have rejected Jesus. It's a good reminder for us even to keep on going after that, and Grudem does that, because he wants to remind us um, that even in this situation, he's not saying this 
as if this is the case for the people that he's writing to, right? So the warnings that he's writing is not saying, and this is you. What I'm saying is that this is you, uh, that this right here is you right now. He's saying right after this, that we speak this, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things that belong to salvation. So uh, in many ways, the warnings can remind us, it can be kind of uh, a helpful boundary for us to know this is what God warns us as it relates to salvation, that if we don't continue on in the faith, then there's a reality that we probably never even knew the Lord. Um, and so the warnings can serve as a way in which God helps preserve us, right? To keep us saying, well, yeah, that's a warning. And I want to believe that. I'm going to trust that. I'm going to, I want to get as far away from that as I can possibly be. That situation before of, of experiencing the Spirit and, and seeing God's power and then walking away. I don't, I don't want to have anything to do with that. And so it's a means by which God continues to still in us uh, faith to continue persevering. So it's a means of God's work in us uh, to continue on. Yes, sir. Question. Um, on, on this Hebrews 6, 4 through 6, uh, going back to Demas a little bit, mm. uh, in Paul's writing, um, many years ago I heard a sermon on this, uh, Jeff, from John MacArthur. Mm. And I took a few notes. And he talks about... Um, he used, he used Demas a little bit to mm. try to get his point across, if I remember correctly. Mm. And he's in, in Colossians 4.14, where he, and in also um, um, in Philemon 24, uh, Paul uses the, the word a fellow worker, mm. which according to John MacArthur in the Greek was a devout meaning, you know, English does a bad job of converting, you know, to, back to the, the Greek. Mm. It means devout Christian. So here Paul is saying that, that Demas was a devout man, okay, mm -hmm. according to the Greek, okay? And, but then you get to 2 Timothy 4.10, and uh, Paul is now condemning according to the Greek, not the English, what we read, mm -hmm. but in the Greek, he's, he's, using kind of, he's using the word apostate. He's committed apostate. Now, you know, and so MacArthur goes on and says, basically, you know, even Paul, Paul kind of agrees with, uh, you know, I don't know if I believe him or not, but he says Paul kind of, kind of, Paul is driving home the point of this Hebrews 6, 4 through 6, that these people did have the Holy Spirit, and they were in control, and, and they, 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 they committed apostate themselves. You know, so... It's, it, boy, it, this, is a, this is a very difficult sure. passage. Here. It is, yeah. as are the warning passages in Hebrews. Um, and so we have to come to it and say, well, okay, well, other parts of Scripture tell us that we're secure, right? God does the work uh, and that we're called to persevere. Um, and that if people don't persevere, then the evidence is that though it may have looked like on the outside, uh, as much as we could tell, that there were believers that really they had not been regenerate. Um, by God, like that actually not been a regenerating work, even though they may have been influenced by the Holy Spirit in some way, um, they still had not yet truly become uh, a believer. He also uses another, another Hebrews passage in Hebrews chapter 10. Um, if we deliberately keep on sinning after we've received the knowledge of the truth, uh, no sacrifice for sins is left. And we also see um, that's not, I mean, uh, outside of... Um, outside of even what we see in passages like um, uh, first, first John, he talks about continuing on in sin. Um, no one born of God makes a practice of sinning for God's seed abides in him. He cannot keep on sinning. Um, and he talks about that in terms of people that are children of God, right? So if, if the pattern of our life is continually going on in sin, then the question becomes, are we, uh, are we truly uh, born again? Um, the next section, which I think is a good one, and this might answer your question a little bit, Mr. Curran, because there's, there's ways in which God works uh, in us by the Spirit. Some, are, some of the, the working that God does are uh, outward kind of working, where you see particular gifts of the Spirit being used. You mentioned things like teaching or um, information like that, but then there are also uh, works that God does internally uh, that maybe nobody sees uh, as kind of an ongoing basis, but over the course of time, 
we do perceive, no, God's working in that person, then they're becoming more uh, like Christ. So some of the things that he talks about, can a, uh, what can give a believer a genuine assurance? Is there anything that can give us genuine assurance? Um, he comes up, uh, he says that there are a few ways. First, do I have a present trust in Christ for salvation? Uh, again, he goes back to um, two passages, one in Colossians and one in Hebrews. Uh, he says, provided that you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel. Uh, and then in uh, Hebrews says, we share in Christ if only we hold our first confidence firm to the end. Uh, so again, uh, this is a reminder that we are called to continue in the faith, uh, to continue uh, trusting Jesus. Um, so the questions that he has there um, today, do I today have a trust in Christ to forgive my sins and make me without blame uh, into, or take me without blame into heaven forever? Do I have confidence in my heart that he has saved me? Uh, if I were to die tonight and stand before God's judgment seat, and if he were to ask me why he should let me in, uh, would I begin to think of my good deeds and depend on them? Or would I without hesitation say that I'm depending on the merits of Christ and have confident that he is a sufficient savior? So the question, question is, um, is my faith in Christ a present reality? Am I presently trusting in Jesus? Not, not is it something that I did a long time ago and now I don't really know about it, but is it an ongoing thing? Am I confident, is my confidence in my salvation based on Jesus' work or is it transition now to my work? Like, is it because of what I do that God's gonna let me in? Or is it always and only because of what Jesus did in my life? Is it always and only because of Jesus' work, not uh, mine? So it is, again, am I confident today in, uh, in Christ's work in my behalf? Now, some, because this, this can be <clears throat> one of those, and he talks about it, uh, the emphasis on present faith stands in contrast to the practice of some testimonies where people repeatedly recite details of a conversion experience that may have happened 20 or 30 years ago. If a, te if a testimony of saving faith is genuine, it should be a testimony of faith that is active to this very day. So it's not just that happened to me. Well, it did happen to me, but is it that, is that stale faith? Is the faith that I had then the same that I have now? Now, have I grown as a Christian? Yes, my life is going to look different, but is the faith the same? Like, am I trusting the same thing for my salvation that I did then? The second is, uh, is there evidence of a regenerating work of the Holy Spirit in my heart. He gives a couple of uh, evidences of that. First, the testimony of the Spirit within our hearts bearing witness that we are God's children. Um, the fruit of the Spirit beginning to be displayed in our lives. Are we growing in love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control? Are we growing in those things? Like, Do we see evidence in my life that God's Spirit is at work in me? And whenever, I, um, whenever I'm walking contrary to that, am I convicted of those things? Um, he says, uh, he talks about the results of one's life and ministry as they have influence on others and on the church. Am I, am, is, uh, are my gifts being used uh, in the church? But he also talks about it in terms of how we are living our lives. Um, are we using, uh, is the Spirit in us, uh, God's Spirit, working in us to encourage other people or is our life bent on discouraging people? Right? So if you think about people, um, is my life bent on dragging people down, to injure people's faith, to bring up controversies and divisiveness. And we see in Scripture that there are admonitions against that uh, that the writers of the New Testament tell us about. You admonish them once, and then after a second time, have nothing more to do with them. They're warped in their thinking. Uh, so there are realities that there are people in the church who thrive on division, who try to create division. God's saying, if that's you, then that's, that's, not, that's not what the Spirit of God does. The Spirit of God in us promotes unity, it, provo it promotes uh, moving on towards godliness, not division uh, and, uh, and attacking. Um, the, the next one that he has is that we are continuing to believe and accept the sound teaching of the church. Um, those who begin to deny major doctrines of the faith give serious negative indications concerning their salvation. He gives evidence of this from John, uh, 1 John 1, uh, no one that des denies the Son has the Father. Um, if what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you will abide in the Son and in the Father. And then the last one he gives is a continuing uh, present relationship with Jesus Christ and obedience to God's commands as part of, um, of affirmation, assurance. We see these things happening in our lives. Again, um, 
what he says the next one is is helpful in us kind of framing that okay uh, is it do i see a long-term pattern of growth in my christian life because if we looked at those last ones right so if we looked at the 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 evidence of regenerating work in my uh, in my life and we just looked at it like today right if i was judging my salvation on today did i evidence all the fruits of the spirit no probably not uh did I, uh, did I influence everybody in an encouraging and positive way? Probably not. Did I continue to believe and accept sound teaching of church? Yes. Um, did I, I mean, if, if I looked at a snapshot of my life, then any given day I could question my salvation, right? If I just looked at it one day and said, based on this day, am I saved or not saved? There are some days that I could say, yeah, there's a really serious question on this one. But what we have to do, what scripture calls us to do is to look at the pattern of our lives. It's not just a snapshot, it's the pattern. What does our life look like uh, over against a couple of years or decades of growth and of living? Um, he talks about this as it relates to the passage in 2 Peter, uh, that we are to, um, that, that it, it reminds us that we will never fail. He tells his readers to add to their faith, virtue, knowledge, self-control, steadfastness, godliness, brotherly affection, and love. Um, these are things to abound in our lives. And so we see that it's a long-term pattern of growth. Uh, and I'm sure that as you guys, some of you have been believers for uh, many years, could say, am I different today than I was the day that I became a Christian? Not just different because I'm older, not just different because I have more life experience or business experience, but uh, can I look back and see a marked change in my life because of Christ? Um, and then we look at our pattern of life and say, yeah, whenever I became a believer, maybe I, was, I had no self-control. Right? Whatever, maybe I was caught up in some vice or some uh, habitual sin, but now I see a pattern of self-control in my life that's been growing over the course of years that's, that's directly tied to Jesus, right? That there's nothing else that, is, that could def define that. Um, so we see that those things are uh, what God calls us to, long-term pattern of growth. So here's the question that we, we need to kind of work through. What do I do with those who I am unsure of? So maybe you have a friend or family member, grew up in the church, now has nothing to do with the church. Um, maybe it's somebody that was a deacon in the church and you think, well, they were a deacon, I don't know. I mean, they were a deacon for like 10 years. So maybe they're good. Maybe, maybe, maybe they didn't walk away. Maybe it's just like a season of wandering or something like that. Um, so what do we do with those who we are unsure of? One, we have to remember that scripture does talk to us clearly about this. If their lives for a long period of time, don't possess any of the signs of regeneration, then we have a responsibility to say, well, maybe they're not saved. Um, and I know for, for us, uh, that can be a really emotionally charged situation, right? Because some of these are children, uh, some of these are brothers and sisters, like biologically uh, related to us. And it's hard for us to imagine, well, maybe, maybe they're really not a Christian. Um, maybe they really don't know the Lord. But sometimes that can be the most hopeful thing that we can do, at least in our perspective, because we're at least dealing with biblical categories. Because we know what the response is for people who aren't believers, right? That's repentance and faith in Christ. And we have a, we have a remedy for that, and that's the gospel. And so we can go to them. Number one, we can begin to pray for them. You know, people that you know uh, that who, who you, know, you know people that are, that are not believers that would say, I've never been a believer. I know I'm not a believer. We pray for them, but then there are people that say, no, I'm a Christian, but then you look at their lives and they, you say, well, and I, help me understand. This is, what, this is another thing. Pray for them. Share the gospel with them, right? So this is one of the things that we remind ourselves of, that the gospel isn't just for like, the first time that we come to Christ. Right? It's the, it is the message that we, that we have strength through for our whole Christian lives. And so even for people that have been in the church before, it's not wrong for us to continue to share the gospel with them. Right? It's not wrong for us to continue to share the gospel with each other. Each other. Uh, that's our only hope. Uh, it's never going to be based on our works. But then we also uh, can address their life uh, related to the Word of God. A way that you can do this uh, is very simply, I mean, it, it's, it sounds simple. Again, I don't know your family members. I don't know your friends. Um, but you could say something like, God's Word says this about what it means to follow Jesus. This is like, Whenever we look at God's word, what does it say about following Jesus? What are some marks of people that follow Jesus? See what they say, right? They're obedient to his word. Uh, they love 
Him. Their, their lives are lived for Him. And then we say, this looks, it looks like your life is going in a different direction than that. So this is what the Bible says about what it means to be a believer. This is what it looks like in your life. Help me understand what the difference is. Help me understand how this makes sense. Um, and most people will say, well, it doesn't. Um, or uh, they will say, well, it's just, it's just my way of relating to God. Right? And then we go back and we remind ourselves and remind them that God's word uh, is the authority. It's not our emotions, or our feelings, or how we want to live our lives. Uh, our, our authority for what it means to live our lives is, is God's word. And so we, we go back and we say, well, this is, again, this is what God's word says. This is what you're doing. Help me understand how these things work together. Um, and we can continue on in those conversations with people. Again, those can be some of the challenging situations. And sometimes it goes back to what do they believe about eternal security, right? Because people's lives are going to be based on what they believe. If they believe that as long as I pray to prayer, it doesn't matter how I live, then you're going to have to walk with them through some other biblical passages that say, well, that's not really what the Bible teaches about our lives. Um, or if they're, maybe there are some people that you know that are fearful that they've lost their salvation, that they can't regain it. There's an opportunity to go and share hope with them to say, you know, you think that you've lost this and that you can't, you can't ever be saved. This is what God's word says about salvation and how you can know that you can be secure in that. Um, so there's opportunities for teaching, for evangelism, for prayer, uh, and sometimes for uh, accountability in people's lives. So um, it's a very important doctrine for us. Um, it's a very hopeful doctrine for us, a very comforting doctrine for us. Um, and uh, it's just a, a, an encouragement for us today. So let's pray. And then we can, if we have any additional questions, we can discuss those too. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you that you are all powerful, that you keep us, that you guard us, that you call us, uh, that as your sheep, we hear your voice. Uh, and Lord, I praise you that you, you do secure us. And Father, I also praise you uh, that you've given us your spirit so that we can continue to walk by faith. I pray for these, my brothers and sisters in Christ uh, here today, that as we've heard uh, warnings and we hear a passage of scripture about continuing, that you would that you would strengthen us all to do that, uh, that you'll be gracious to us in this, and that we will continue to faithfully pursue you uh, with our lives. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.